This is a book I wrote called Building Superior Brace Tools. And every couple years, I update it to based on whatever the current problems are. Um, one of the things you'll run into, if you haven't already, is a lot of the people out there doing brazing don't know the difference between brazing and welding, uh, or they're welders. So they tend to want to apply alloy like this, and in brazing, you need to apply alloy between the two parts. Um, That'll, be, that'll become clear as we get down. This is more about carbide. I'll tell you what, let me go back up here. We'll start with cleaning. And I think that the number one problem with braze failure is improper cleaning. Brazing tungsten carbide. With brazing tungsten carbide, this was a, this was a farm tool, um, a harrow. They were having problems because they couldn't get this part the carbide to stick to this part, the steel. Their analysis was that there was chrome in the steel. And because there was chrome in the steel, it, was, it wasn't sticking to it. You will find in some grades, in some grades of stainless steel with a high chromium content, if they don't use enough flux and they use too much heat, they can create chromium carbides, which really screws it up. The only way to treat that is to treat the stainless steel part with hydrofluoric acid to remove the chromium carbides and then braze to it. I don't tell them that because hydrofluoric acid penetrates through the skin into the bone. One of the recommended first aid measures for hydrofluoric acid exposure is amputation. So, um, it, it's that bad. What we did here on this is we took some very small bits of wire we put them on, we put them on the, uh, the steel, the mating surface of the steel, we put them on the mating surface of the carbide with some black flux and heated them with a torch. You can see here there are two extremely, there are two little dots where that's all the braze alloy that's stuck to the carbide here. In this case what you got is you got a big glob of the braze alloy. On the other hand on the steel it ran across it and stuck nicely. So the problem was not the steel. We had half a, it's not real clear, but there's a body back here and it's a great, it serves as a great big heat sink. This is a much thinner section, so I got tired of heating it up. Once we demonstrated that it was going to flow well, that's half of, a, half of an alloy bit. If you can get a customer, if you have problem, the, I have never gotten bad alloy. I got bad alloy once from one of your competitors who has now passed away, but so it's not out there anymore. But what they did is they ended up somehow putting two kind they ended up putting two kinds of alloy on the same reel. Something else I told Emmett last night. The AWS specifications for braze alloy. So a 56% silver braze alloy will be 55 to 57. Okay? The specs we get from you guys are 56 and a fraction measured in millions, okay? So your 56% braze alloy truly is 56%. The competition can still be within the American Welding Society specs and sell a 55.1% braze alloy. This is really important to us because we have computerized we control the speed through our belt furnaces within a tenth of a second. We control the temperature plus or minus two degrees. So we have a chart depending on what we're running and the size. We set it to that. We want them to run through and flow. If the alloy composition is not exactly right, then they don't flow right. If they don't flow right, we have to take them off the end, clean them, sort them, inspect them, retreat, and run them through again, which we don't, we don't make a hell of a lot more money out of brazing than you guys do. There's just not that much money into it. So your braze alloy is not, your braze alloy is as good as anybody's. It's also on our analysis we've had done. Your braze alloy is always, always right on the money. Um, we have never caught you guys cheating on the specs with a little less silver. 
and you figure it out, 1% of silver on however many tons of braze alloy you sell would be, it's got to be really tempting. Some of your competition does, you guys don't. Anyway, we saw this. When we get down here, this is, this is testing the steel, and this is testing the steel for cleanliness. This is our high-tech eyedropper. Um, this is a piece of steel saw plate. What we did is we cleaned this area with oven cleaner. Um, we recommend Easy Off Oven Cleaner to clean, the, to clean the plate because it cleans oil and grease as well. It's cheap, it's easy to find, and everybody thinks it's dangerous. So we don't want anybody hurt. Um, this is the unclean plate. You can see here where you have a, a high bubble. There's an angle there's an angle formed by the side of that bubble called the angle of incidence. If I could do that straight. Um, so the bubble has a steeper angle than the puddle on the left. So it has a higher angle of incidence. This is how you technically measure wetting. It's a hard concept to explain to a lot of guys in the shop. So we tell them to take an eyedropper, put a drop of water or two on it, and see what kind of a puddle it forms. If it forms a bubble, typically they have something on the surface of the steel. Um, nobody likes rusty steel, so steel typically comes with some sort of a protectant on it. Um, any sort of a protectant is more than likely going to have carbon in it, um, and that interferes with the brazing. Brazing is a chemical process, the way we look at it. So you get two kinds of bonds. You get a physical bond. So if you have two rough surfaces, you can join them like that with braze alloy and get some strength. The real strength comes from a chemical bond, and the braze alloy will form an intermetallic. And what we think happens with the braze alloy is the silver and the tungsten carbide forms a silver tungstate too. But if you look, and we'll, we'll try and find some pictures later, but you can form an intermetallic where you see the two materials actually mesh like that, and that's where you get the huge strength from. So you have to have the surfaces really clean because if you get the carbon on it, um, if you have a surface like this, and even if they try and do the famous clean it with a torch, if you clean it with a torch, what you do is you burn the material and you burn the material, it's like burning anything else. You leave an ash residue that seriously interferes. So if they get, if they take an eyedropper and get a, or a squeeze ball or any damn thing they want, and get a nice flat puddle like that, it's a real good sign of cleanliness.